morning. My name is Nasser. And uh, I came to this country from the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia during the first Gulf War. Got stranded here because of that war. And when I came here, I came as a very, very devout Sunni Muslim. But I would say that I wasn't your average Muslim. I was pretty radical. I was the kind of guy that, you know, today would probably be signing up to go join the Taliban or join Al-Qaeda or ISIS. I was very, very much convinced that Islam was the true religion. And I was very much convinced that the rest of the world was in a war, whether they knew it or not, with Islam. And that I needed to defend my religion, even if that meant killing people. And when I got stranded here in this country, I didn't quite know what to do at first. I really didn't like the United States that much. I thought it was a very heathen, very godless country. I thought it was interesting that they refer to themselves as a Christian nation, but then are the biggest exporters of violence and movies and music and pornography and war in the world. And I sort of attributed all that to Christianity and the fruit of Christianity. And I thought, well, if I'm going to be here, if I'm going to be stuck here for however long it lasts, maybe I can do some good. At that time, virtually nobody that I spoke to here in the Midwest had any notion of what Islam was, what a Muslim was. And I thought, I can do something about that. I know what a Muslim is. I'm a Muslim. I can teach people. I thought I can establish a Muslim community here in the Midwest and be kind of like a Muslim missionary and teach Americans about Islam and maybe some of them will see the truth and become Muslim. And I did that for five years and had some success. Saw many people come from various walks of life, some who claim to come from a Christian background, give up all of that and become a Muslim here in the U.S. And after about five years, I met the, the beautiful woman here who became my wife. And even though she came from a, a Christian background, she was like a lot of Christians that I met. She hadn't gone to church that often. She didn't really read the Bible. She was sort of a Christian by culture, by birth. And so when she married me, she suddenly had a very important decision to make. She could become a Muslim, which is what I wanted. Or she could finally get serious about following Jesus. And not long after we got married, she became pregnant with her first daughter. And then suddenly, she realized she was going to have to make a decision that was going to affect now two lives. Hers and her unborn baby. And what would the rest of our children believe? And so she chose Jesus. And she very quickly discovered that I wasn't going to be swayed by apologetics, by various arguments. Sharing with me John 3.16 really didn't do much for me. The only weapon that she had to fight this war on behalf of her husband was prayer. And so she prayed. She prayed every day that God would speak to me. She started getting back to church, studying the Bible. And she felt led to gather others to intercede before God on my behalf. And so quickly over a two-year span, you know, we had dozens and then hundreds and then thousands of believing Christians, praying for some Muslim guy they never met, that God would reveal himself. And so after two years of that, God began to work on my heart. And I told you I was devout. I, I thought I was about as, as righteous as you could get as a Muslim person, I, I was pretty comfortable in feeling that, you know, if I were to die, that I had done enough good, that I had a pretty good chance that as I was judged before God, that I would be able to enter heaven. 
Well, suddenly, I felt God sort of revealing to me that my heart wasn't quite as pure as I thought it was. And that while I did a really good job of presenting a good front to everyone around me in the Muslim community, my family, neighbors, what have you, God sees more than the outside. He sees into the soul, into the heart of a person. And he knew my heart was full of pride and jealousy and lust, bigotry, anger, unforgiveness. And I wasn't fooling him. And I realized that the standard that I had set in my own mind for the holiness, the righteousness that God required for heaven was higher than I ever thought. It was out of reach for me. And I wondered, you know, I wonder how other people are, are coping with this, other Muslims. Do they struggle with this too, of not feeling worthy, good enough, holy enough for God? And I was not at all convinced at this point that there was any other way to reach God. I was, I was convinced that I had to be better. I had to be a, try harder to be a better Muslim, to read the Quran more, memorize more, pray more, extra prayers, fast more, whatever I could do to get rid of the weight of my sin. And during this time, my wife, my wife had been inviting me for months and months to attend church with her. And so I decided to start going to church. I wasn't really threatened by a church service. I'd been around enough Christians. I'd seen people who said they were Christians become Muslim. You know, I'd been hit over the Bible countless times. But I thought maybe if I go to church, I can learn a little bit more. Maybe it'll help me in my apologetics, my arguments with Christians to help show them why they're wrong and Islam is right. And, and who knows, maybe some Christians that I meet in the church would be good candidates to become Muslim. And maybe that would give me something, some kind of favor with God. And so I'm sitting in a church on a Sunday morning. I think it was maybe six or eight weeks into this process. And the pastor was preaching on the cross. And so immediately I'm just mentally checked out because the cross is the sort of the crux, if you will, of the problem that I had with the gospel, with Christianity. Because as a Muslim, I didn't believe in the divinity of Jesus. I didn't believe in the necessity or even the, that it was even logical for one man to die for everyone else. And so I thought, oh, here's this nonsense. And I, I just, I checked out. So I was sort of sitting there thinking about other things, but I, the thought popped into my head, wouldn't it be nice? Wouldn't it be nice if the gospel was true? Wouldn't that address the very problem, the very struggle that is going on right now in your heart? And I thought, yeah, I suppose, but I know all the reasons why it's not true. And I thought, you know, I mean, how could I accept, how could I ever believe that God, who is greater than all things, who made all things, who is limitless, literally limitless, would humble and humiliate himself by coming in the form of a man, being born as a baby? I mean, how ridiculous. And then to try to even take it a step further and say that my God, who is so holy, whose honor is above reproach, would allow himself to be mocked, to be spit on, to be brutally tortured, and then nailed and stripped to a cross. No, I, I, couldn't, I can't believe that about God, my God. 
And I thought in my mind, if that was the truth, you know, I've, I've yet to encounter a single person who can explain to me how that makes sense. And I thought, God, if that was the truth, you're going to have to show me how that makes sense. You're going to have to show me why. And then, boom, I instantly had a vision. And it was really crazy because I was not expecting God to respond to me, to be quite honest. I mean, who am I? I'm nobody. I'm one guy sitting in a church of thousands. Why is God listening? Why does God care what's going on in my head, in my heart? But God gave me a vision. And suddenly I, the pews, the pastor, all of it was gone. All the sounds were gone. The only thing I could see right in front of me was this rocky hill and this man in front of me being crucified. And he was bloodied from head to toe beaten beyond recognition. But I knew that that was Jesus. I just knew it. And as I watched him on the cross suffering, and I looked into his eyes, I knew that I was looking into the eyes of someone who was more than just a man. I was looking into the eyes of a king, of the king of kings. And there he was. The very thing that I could not believe was playing out right in front of me. And as if that wasn't bad enough, then I saw this darkness sort of superimposed over everything and there was a movement to it. It was being gathered up and I knew that that was my sin. That sin that I couldn't overcome. That I couldn't get rid of. There it was. Along with the sin of every other person on the face of the planet, every, every human being from the beginning to the end, their sin being gathered up and being poured out on Jesus. And he took every last bit of it. All of it. And as he died, as he cried out in victory that it was finished, it was finished. That sin was gone. It was gone. It was like suddenly there was light. Suddenly there was air to breathe again. And I heard a voice from above me saying, that was why. Because that was the only way, the only way that you and I could have a relationship. And it was worth it to me to pay that price. And then boom, vision's gone. Back in the church, I'm disoriented what just happened. Why are there people still here? Because I felt like I'd been gone for hours. I really did. And the pastor was, was closing up the service as he did every single Sunday. And I'd been around long enough that I kind of got an idea of the route. This was routine. And he would ask you know, everyone in the congregation to, to bow their heads in prayer. And he would, he would invite anyone out there who wanted who wanted to, to submit their lives to God through Jesus. To receive forgiveness, to be set free. To simply pray this prayer. And every week he would do this. And every week I would mock it. I would think how silly that is. Because as a Muslim, I mean, I was praying five times every day. My head bowed before God, worshiping. And Christians think they're going to pray this one magic prayer one time in church and then everything's great. I mean, how silly. But that Sunday, after seeing what I just saw, my head was bowed and these words were coming out of my mouth. Jesus, you are the Lord. You are the Savior. Forgive me. Save me. And it was literally like a fire fell on me. The presence and the power of God just 
fill me up. I didn't know what was happening. And my mind was racing, thinking, no, 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 you, you got to take this back. You can't do this. You, you're a Muslim. You were born a Muslim. You don't change. You don't leave the one true religion. You don't turn your back on your culture, on your heritage, on your family. You don't do that. It's unthinkable. My mind's saying all this, but my heart is saying yes. Wow. This is what peace feels like. Amen. This is what the presence of God feels like. Amen. Wow. And as I got up and I walked out of that church, I realized I would never be the same. That I had, I had been resurrected in my spirit. That I had been dead before. And I think it's so great that it just happened to work out that the morning that I get to share all this with you, you guys are talking about, you know, Ephesians chapter 6. Because... The entire world is, is under attack by our adversary. It's not like he just is going after Christians. He's going after everybody. You look at what's happening right now back in my homeland. Maybe you look at what's going on in Iraq and in Syria and Afghanistan and all the atrocities and all the killing. You think all the source of that is just in human hearts? The enemy is at work all over this world, spreading death. You know, Jesus said that the enemy comes to steal and kill and destroy, and that's what he always does. And everyone on this planet is fighting that battle against him, whether they know it or not. But what we have is Jesus. Amen. You know, Paul talks about being clothed in Christ, but I love that he, he describes it a little bit more fully in Ephesians 6 about putting on the armor of God. He's been talking about through the whole letter in Ephesians about how everything that we have is in and because and through Christ Jesus. You know, in Ephesians 1, it's just this beautiful list of all of the things that we have, all of the richness of our spiritual blessings, our inheritance in Christ Jesus. He is literally our identity. And then in Ephesians 2, he goes into talking about how we are seated with Christ in the heavenlies. Not because we're worthy, but because he's already told us how God has made us worthy in Jesus to now sit with him in fellowship at his table. How crazy is that? We get to sit and align our hearts in the presence of God with our king. And then he talks about in Ephesians 4, how we get to walk with Christ now. We're seated with him, and now we can get up and walk, and he is walking through us. He is living life through us, touching people all around us. It's, mir it's miraculous. And then finally we get to six, and now, now that we understand all that, now we can put on the armor. We can put on Jesus, because Jesus is our righteousness. I thought I had, I tried to be righteous as a Muslim. I couldn't do it. But Jesus can. Jesus can. His righteousness is sufficient and becomes ours. You know, in 2 Corinthians, Paul wrote that he who knew no sin became sin so that we, brothers and sisters, might become the righteousness of God. And we wear that as a breastplate over our heart to protect us from the enemy. We have Jesus. Jesus said he is the truth. And he's our belt holding us together. His truth holds us together. We, we walk on the gospel of peace. He's the prince of peace. The gospel is just us proclaiming the good news of his message, his mission. To save this world through his church because of what he's done. Our helmet of salvation. Jesus is our salvation. Every other religion in the world tells you, you've got to do this, you've got to do that. You've got to try to work, you've got to try to earn, you've got to try to become. And Jesus just says, here, here is salvation. Here is assurance of eternal life. I did all the work. I did it, Jesus says. And I give it to you as a gift. Will you take it? Yes, amen. And then even the shield of faith, you know, we are saved by grace 
through faith. But then Paul says earlier, I think it's in Ephesians 2, that even this is not of yourself, but is a gift of God. Even the faith, the shield that we have is a gift of God. We don't have to, you know, manufacture our own faith or try, try to have faith. He gives us faith if we ask him. And that's our shield. And then the word of God. The word of God and prayer. These are the weapons that a follower of Jesus fights with. God's word. God's power. God's might. And I didn't have any of that before. And now I do because of Jesus, because everything I have, all that I am, all of my inheritance, all the promises of God are in Christ Jesus. And praise him for it.